So Bob, of course, is uh, known for many things. Uh, known for being a uh, discoverer of GMCSF, the uh, T-cell growth factor, which we now know of, Thial 2 I think these are incredibly important discoveries. And then uh, was the discoverer of the first human retrovirus, HGLV-1, um, at a time when uh, really nobody was willing to believe that there would be retroviruses in man. Um, and of course now he is best known for his many, many, many contributions to the field of HIV. So today he's going to talk about uh, progress toward a preventive vaccine uh, against HIV. Bob. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to the uh, or local organizing committee and to Katie for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that if you live long enough, you, feel, you find a full circle, I think, in life. I think uh, Steve will appreciate maybe some of this, uh, but it doesn't go back quite far enough. Well, I began in retrovirology uh, quite a long time ago, almost 40 years ago. And at that time, uh, Steve hinted to it, and not only wasn't there a belief in human retroviruses as even a possibility, there was reluctance to consider retroviruses as infectious agents, even in animals, as particularly relevant to anything other than in laboratory experiments. Everything was endogenous retroviruses, or endogenous retroviral sequences, so the, the activation of which was important in normal physiology with no data. The activation of which was important to virtually all cancer. There were some theories in, in that regard, and that was a, a big push in the field. And so when exogenous retroviruses became apparent in animals, and by 1980 also in man, there became a shift in the other direction. Oh, endogenous viruses will never find a place or a role. Endogenous sequences will be impossible to prove as being relevant to anything. Certainly not in human disease, and least of all in normal physiology. Now you just hear this wonderful story, which has been evolving, if we can use that word again, uh, over perhaps the last decade or maybe more, so that in a way things have come together. So it looks like a whole bunch of things are important and uh, we, we fuse together. Uh, I selected to give a, a kind of a progress report on our thinking about the possibility of an HIV preventive vaccine. So I want to begin by uh, with a reminder slide. How do we, What's the, where do I, oh, I see it here. Yeah, I, I thought it would be of use for this particular audience to think for a moment about the practical advances for, in HIV AIDS uh, in the past and what is needed for the future. And the reason I thought it's useful to bring it up because as far as I can see, all the practical advances we have in HIV and AIDS today came from experimental laboratory research, if not from pure basic research in itself. And I think it's important actually for funding reasons and for funding arguments, because at least in HIV AIDS research there's a lot of pressure for things to become completely pragmatic. That is to say like education, behavioral research, and you constantly have to defend the value of the experimental laboratory research. So what are those major advances that occurred in a practical way? Uh, the first was 1984, it's the blood test. Then came antiretroviral therapy, beginning in 1985-86, uh, Sam Broder, NCI, with AZT, culminating in the triple drug and bringing in the pharmaceutical industry. And if you think about it for a moment, that's the first time in history we have antiviral therapy uh, really uh, being the reason that the pharmaceutical industry came and got involved heavily in now thinking about many other viruses for antiviral therapy before there was nothing or there were vaccines, it was kind of all or nothing at all. And along those lines of therapy for infected people, you could have educational programs because you knew who was infected from the blood test. You knew who to educate, who to treat. Um, you then had mother-child transmission blockade so that for all practical purposes, pediatric AIDS is gone in the industrial world. So all of these came out of virus discovery, virus growth, with IL-2 virus growth in cell line, characterization of the genes, characterization of the proteins, um, culture systems for targeting HIV with drugs. And, and as I say, I think it's useful to keep in mind. The two great practical advances from research that are needed for the future, other than, well, a third one would be bringing drugs to developing nations. That's, of course, not so much from laboratory research but are obviously trying to reach a cure so you don't have the problem of lifelong therapy. 
um, drug toxicity, drug resistance, the need for new drugs. So kind of reaching toward a cure. And the other is the search for um, successful preventive vaccine, the topic of, of, of what I want to do today. So the background for this is given on the next few slides. A rational decision that a vaccine has to be a subunit was made right at the onset of the field. What that means is that we can't, obviously we can't use live attenuated virus. It seems that the envelope with an LTR is enough to cause disease. No matter how much you cripple this thing, you've got serious danger and would never be approved by FDA. Um, killed whole virus, something that the brief entry into the field of Jonas Salk was pushing for, and just feeling that by the time you grew the virus, we had a vaccine because we could just kill it with formula and things like that, like he did with the so-called Salk polio vaccine is what would be a successful vaccine for HIV. But such a, a kill whole virus is still too hazardous for an FDA acceptance and also simply doesn't work. It loses its appropriate immunogenicity. So people proceeded to subunits very quickly, including our own group when we were testing vaccines. You start realizing that there is no responsible group. 1984, periods when we understood the causes of the disease, there was no responsible group for finding a vaccine or developing a vaccine. So you suddenly say, wow, it's the retrovirologists that are going to have to think about it. That slowly began to change. So the, the concept was right away GP120, which is rational. So we, GP120 because you'd induce neutralizing antibodies and maybe you could reach sterilizing immunity, a concept I think we have to return to strongly. However, the GP120 that was selected for use in a well-known clinical trial by a company in California called Vaxgene was a total failure. But it was a predictable failure, and in my mind it was not based on science. The reason I say that is the envelope, the very envelope that was used, GP120 from a strain called MN, which was a 1983 isolate from our lab and grown in culture since the beginning of 1984, was already known in primate experiments to produce only type-specific immunity. Indeed, all GP120s, unadulterated, unmodified, the standard GP120 from any retrovirus that was tested, gave type-specific immunity. So you'd get neutralizing antibodies and you could have success against the virus you used to prepare the GP120. So this was a predictable failure, but it raised $250 million. It failed, and people said, well, we will learn something. But what we learned was you get hostility. What we learned was that there'd be less money for basic research and that the pharmaceutical industry would gradually disappear from interest in HIV vaccines, which is certainly the case today. Another problem, and it's still a problem today in not all the field, but a good part of the field, is a continued use of homologous challenge viruses in most primate studies. This doesn't mean very much because of type-specific immunity. What I mean by homologous, of course, is you challenge the primate with the same virus you use to make the vaccine. When you see that and you see claims, you know, stand back. Well, with that failure, uh, there was a decline in interest in vaccines until probably the late 19, uh, oh, maybe, I don't know the years exactly, maybe in sometime in the 1990s, there was a, a major movement to vaccines based on cell-mediated immunity only. Now, all of us would think in immunology that cell-mediated immunity is a good thing to have if you're going to have an HIV preventive vaccine. But when you have it alone, and that's been the common push today, I think there's still problems. The notion was that we won't prevent infection, but we can prevent disease. We will lower the amount of HIV in the person vaccinated, so that person won't develop disease, and we can declare victory and go home. We won't try to prevent infection because it's too difficult. But the problem with one study's primate model is that how long will this last? If you're infected, variants sooner or later emerge. And so I believe this too was a predictable failure, but it did lead to major clinical trials which did fail, and unfortunately, at least two of those trials, there's an increase in infection in the vaccinated group. I won't get into that unless somebody really wants to discuss it, but there are understandable reasons of what happened.